Well, welcome to Focal Point. Welcome to those of you who are watching us online as well. Uh, we are glad to be here, and we are starting uh, the second week of our series called Co-Mission, which is joining God where He's at work. Uh, we're doing this as we're launching our growth group semester this week. Someone say this week. Not next week, this week. We're starting back up growth groups. So if you're already a part of a growth group, make sure that you reconnect. Uh, maybe you don't have a growth group or maybe, uh, you know, maybe your schedule changed and that growth group doesn't fit for you anymore. Uh, connect with somebody today. If you just don't know what group to go to, we have that tent in the lobby. We'd love to just help you find the group that fits your schedule, your needs. We have 35 uh, growth groups at our church, uh, some for our middle schoolers and high schoolers on Wednesday nights. We've got plenty of groups, uh, men, women, couples combined, uh, families, uh, you know, all we got Brazilian, uh, Portuguese speaking groups, got all sorts of groups. So I'm sure that there's one that fits your schedule and the kind of group that you want to be a part of. Uh, so come check it out, check it out, connect with us. We'll help you find the group. All right. All right, so we are uh, connecting our series that we've talked through the summer, which we focused on experiencing God. Uh, when we looked through that series, I think one of the, the main components that really was standing out to many of us was that God is always at work. He's at work in and around our lives, our family, our church, but even more so than that, God is at work. He is on a mission, and through a love relationship with us, he gives us the grace to join him, to connect to him in his mission and in his work that he's, uh, that he's try- seeking to accomplish on the earth today. One of the greatest uh, missions that he has is called the Great Commission, which we'll read about in Matthew 28. Now, just to set it up so we're all on the same page, Jesus at this point had already died. He rose from the dead. Now he is talking to the disciples before he ascends into heaven, he's giving them like one last commission. This is what I want you to go do. And he says this in Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus said to them, and, uh, came to them and said, all authority uh, on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything. Someone say everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I love how Jesus even begins it because you can imagine whenever you're given a, a, a mission or a project, maybe at, at work or even in your family, your life, whatever it is, we feel a burden and we put it on our shoulders. So I've got to figure out how to say the words that's going to help convince somebody, help to, I got to figure out through all the problems and challenges how to navigate all of these things. And so Jesus is coming to tell them, I'm, I'm calling you to something. And you can imagine the pressure, the weight that the disciples would likely have put on their shoulders to try to help make disciples of nations. How do we do that? But Jesus starts by saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so the support, the backing, the authority that you're gonna walk in is not your own. It's not yours to figure out. It's not your name. It's not your charisma. It's not your ability to speak. It's not your giftings. It's Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Remember, they just saw him in the, in, in the tomb. They just saw the risen savior rise again. They know that when Jesus is saying this, there's authority in what he's saying. There's a power and an authority. I'm sending you with the name of Jesus, the power of Jesus, And by that authority, I'm telling you, go and make disciples of all nations. That you go out and make disciples. Not that you start church services. Not that you do good deeds. Make disciples. Disciple is a follower of Jesus. Not people who just hear about Jesus, but followers. People who put into practice, who lay down their life to commit and submit to the, the teachings of Jesus. That he wants to make disciples of Jesus across the earth. He's saying, I'm giving you this authority. And remember, so, so Jesus created the church as the vehicle by which he would help to spread the gospel and to make disciples. Uh, soon before Jesus died, uh, on their journey to Jerusalem, Jesus turns to Peter and he tells him, he says, I'm establishing my church. And he says, on this rock, I'm building my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
So Jesus dies. He forgives us, cleanses us of our sins. He frees us and he establishes the church and says, I want you now with this vehicle to go and make disciples of all nations. God's given us this call as a church. Again, we don't want to just have services. I'm thankful for our services. I'm thankful for the many good deeds we have at our church. But God called us to make disciples to help make followers of Jesus Christ that would lay down their lives and say, I'm committing my life to following you, Jesus Christ. And so through this series, we're helping to just even show you how God called our church, specifically the, the mission that God's given us and how we're seeking to accomplish that task to make disciples. Uh, we can put up the graphic. Pastor Vinny shared last week on the first E, which is to engage our culture and community that the very first part is that we're engaging with people around us. We're not just staying in our church services and having a good time together. We wanna go reach people for Jesus. We're all called to be difference makers for Jesus. Now, the second part, though, is as we reach people, we want to establish them in relationship and discipleship. And so that's the one we're going to focus on today, is that we're called to be established in our relationships together, as well as in discipleship that we're growing in our faith with one another. And so today, we're going to look at that, E, about how we can be established in those things, and really how that establishes a foundation. Someone say foundation. How it establishes a foundation for our life. For us to join God's mission, we have to be grounded in his mission. We have to have our feet planted in such a way that we can join God in what he's seeking to do. In our life, we all put our feet securely somewhere. We all have a foundation underneath our feet which we're building our lives upon. Now, it could be a faulty, worldly foundation. It could be a foundation that is founded on Jesus and his word. And that's a, it, 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 depending on what we choose is where our feet are planted and how sure our feet are on that foundation. Ephesians 4, uh, Paul tells us as church leaders that we're seeking to help equip the saints, the church members, that we're helping to raise up church members to, to the work of the ministry, that we would walk in unity and that we would learn more about Jesus. And if we do that, Paul says in Ephesians 4, 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful schemes. He's saying there's gonna be things that are gonna shake us. You just open up any social media. You look at TikTok or, or YouTube. You've got, we've given way too many people platforms to share their feelings, what they think. And, and there's so many different deceitful schemes and, and, and ways, ideologies and ways to view scripture and all of these things. And there's, there's moves that are happening all around us. And so we, as the people of God, have to know where do I put my feelings? feet? Where do I plant them so that when all of these different doctrines and teachings and ways of thinking are coming, I know where I'm standing. I know what the truth is, and I know where I can plant my feet. And that's by us all seeking to walk this road together, that we know the, the truth of the scriptures, and we have something underneath our feet, right? Jesus says it this way. He says in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 24, it says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine right? That's the first step, to hear these words of Jesus and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Someone say the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, when I read this, what I don't hear Jesus saying is, if you hear these words of mine, you put them into practice, then the storms are gonna be averted from your life. I, I don't hear Jesus telling us, hey, you just do what I say, and you're gonna walk through an easy life. There's gonna be no problems, no battles, no challenges. In fact, what I hear him saying is, the same storm is coming to those who put into practice what I say and to those who don't put into practice. But depending on what you do with what I give you is gonna determine whether your house can stand or whether it can't stand. 
Many times we wanna pray for the storms to get changed from our life. I don't like storms in my life. I don't like to be in the midst of a storm. And so we want to get out of the storm. But Jesus is saying, I'm giving you the tools. I know what's coming up in two years. I know the battles that you're gonna face in five years. I know what I'm raising you up to do in 10 years. I know what's coming against your family. I know every battle that is formed against your children. And I know how to prepare you to be able to withstand the storms. Not not to divert the storms, but to stand in the midst of the storms of life. And so the way that we're, we're praying and the way that we try to help establish people isn't to try to go through life storm-free, but that we can be storm-proof, that we can build a life that is able to withstand the storms that come in life. The greatest way that we can be storm-proof is to focus on the foundations that we are building our life on. Foundations aren't flashy, they're not exciting, but when I, you go to check out a house, you're never like looking at the foundation, making sure everything's good. You're looking at the amenities. You're looking at the open concept and how many bedrooms does this have? And oh, that master bathroom's so nice. And I just love that. We look at all the amenities, but the amenities are worthless if you don't have a good foundation. If the foundation can't withstand the storm, all these beautiful things that you add to your house mean nothing, have no value without a sure footing. And the same goes for our spiritual foundations. Depending on how deep and how strong our foundation is will determine how strong our spiritual life is, how much we can withstand, how big our spiritual life can grow and the impact that we can have in our life. And so we're gonna look at what materials we need to help build a spiritual foundation for our life. The first one is this, we must be established in the word of God. We must be established in the word of God. Jesus, when he was sharing in Matthew 7, and he was talking about that we need to hear the word of God. Experiencing God, we learn there's many times Jesus is talking. God is talking to us. Sometimes we're not even in position to hear him. So the first step really is to be in a position where my mind can be quieted, where all the noise and the battles and the chaos of life, where it can be quieted down so I can even hear his words, where I actually open the Bible and I'm reading the word of God so I can even be in position so that God can speak to me. That's the first part. I need to hear his words and I need to put it into practice. It's one thing to be around uh, church people and to hear that God is my provider. It's a whole other step to trust him as my provider. Right? It's one thing to know that Jesus loves me and know that there's nothing that will separate me from his love, but it's a whole other thing to receive his love by faith, that even at my worst moments that I'm receiving his love into my life, right? It's one thing to know that I'm supposed to love other people like Jesus loves me. It's a whole other thing to love somebody at their worst moments when all the injustice and everything that they've said about me, and I feel like they stabbed me in the back and to still choose to be loved to that person in that moment, it's a whole other thing to put it into practice. Jesus says, I want you to hear these words of mine and put it into practice. If you do that, you're gonna build a foundation that is able to stand on the rock. James says this in James chapter one, verse 22. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. I love this because he's saying, don't deceive yourselves by simply hearing the word of God. We can try to listen to a bunch of things and we can get the knowledge of things. Knowledge doesn't help us in the midst of the storm. Putting it into practice is what's gonna give us grace to withstand the storms of life. Simply knowing that God can do something doesn't help us in the midst of that crisis, but trusting in God, putting those things into practice and standing on that foundation when it feels like all hell is coming against you and having the 
the history with God to know, I know it's hard right now. I don't know how you're gonna do it, but I know that your word is true and you're not gonna fail me here. That's the rock underneath our feet. That's something that's solid in the midst of trials and challenges. He says, put it into practice. Do what God says. Jesus is looking for doers of the word. That's what a disciple is. There were many teachers at that time. There were many people who were teaching godly principles. You could hear somebody teaching, but it was when you chose to follow that person's teachings, you became a disciple of that person. And James is saying, be disciples, be doers of the word. And he uses this picture of looking in the mirror. And I love the picture because the word of God really is a mirror to our souls. The word of God shows us the things inside of us that are lacking. Being in the word of God, being around the word of God has shown me I'm not as patient as I thought I was. I, I don't love to the standard that God's called me to love. And it's being in the word of God that it convicts you. It shows you where your character is falling short. Anybody a witness to that in here? Where being in the word of God has shown you how to love other people, how to interact with one another, how to love God, how to give my whole life to him, right? It's a mirror to our souls. The same way you look in a mirror, right? You you look at it. I'm I'm hopefully that you're not just like looking in the mirror to admire yourself. You're trying to see the things that need fixing in life, right? You see, I got some, some spinach in my teeth. I need to get that spinach out of my teeth, right? If you're like me, you got a bad cow lick that goes on every single morning. You're like, well, I got to put some water on that. I got to fix that cow lick, right? Or you get to the age where your eyebrow hair grew three inches overnight. And you're like, that's a problem. I don't know how that one hair got like superpowers overnight, but I need to do something about that right? You you look in the mirror to do something about it. If you saw your eyebrow hair grow and your spinach in your teeth and a cow lick going crazy and you simply saw it and like, well, that's a problem, but you left and did nothing about it, you're like, that's kind of crazy. You want to be presentable to other people as you go throughout your day. The same thing as we read the word of God, if we do it and it's showing us the areas that are flawed in our life, but we do nothing about it, then it's foolish. And it's like building your life on the sand, The storms are going to come whether we do what God says or not. Storms are coming, but can I withstand the storms? And what do I need to do to be stormproof in my life? Friends, we have to build a consistent relationship that is revolving around the word of God, that is based on the word of God. God's word doesn't change. People, culture changes, political parties change, people's opinions change, but God's word never changes. It's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Psalm 119, 89 says, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. David says in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Hebrews says that his word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. God's word is powerful for our lives. It doesn't change. That's why it's a rock underneath our feet. Things change in life. People's opinions always change around us. Sometimes they think of us greatly and sometimes we're low before. It doesn't matter because God's word never changes. That's what I put my feet on. That's what I stand on. And that's what's going to get me through what I go through. You know, living in Florida, you hear about hurricanes all the time, right? We've never tried to figure out how to get the hurricane to go away from us. We understand the hurricane is coming, whether we like it or not. But we've had codes that to help us build houses that can withstand storms with the right foundations and the right right window strength. And maybe you go outside and you board up your windows. You get generators. You get extra water and food so that you can ride out and withstand whatever storm comes your way. That's what we need to do spiritually in our lives. Can I share a testimony with you about this? You know, and and back in... um, I guess it was 2021, um, you know, when, when I was 16 or 17, I found out I had scoliosis and then I found out I have bulging discs. Um, so it was just hereditary to what I was born with. And so I had back pain for the next 14 years or so, uh, on and off. It was when in 2021, I was 30 years old and I got a rude awakening to my 30s. Hit me like a two by four, a couple months into being 30. 
and I had what the doctors called a slip disc, two slip discs. It was incredibly painful. Um, I, I looked like a paralyzed person for about a week. I couldn't move. I couldn't get up by myself. I could maybe stand for like 30 seconds. I had to go lay back down. It was incredibly painful. But in the midst of that pain, it was incredibly discouraging. It was some of my lowest points spiritually where I was very discouraged, but I was praying bold prayers. I mean, I believed that God was gonna heal me. Third day of all this was Easter Sunday. I mean, I was like, God's gonna heal me. I got full confidence. I had the house to myself. I was at my parents' house at the time trying so that I could have help. Everybody was gone. While you guys were here on that Easter Sunday, I was praying bold prayers. I was like, I'm gonna be upstanding by the time everybody gets back and it's gonna be like a miracle. And I believed it. I was crying out by faith. And Easter came and went, and I was still laying there. I was still in pain, but God was talking. He was speaking to me, and he reminded me of that, that part of Scripture where Paul was praying. He had the thorn in his flesh. And he says three times, uh, Paul pleaded, let this thorn be moved from my side. And it says that God responded to him and said, my grace is sufficient for you, that my power is made perfect in your weakness. Oh, that was so good, but also I didn't like that prayer. I wanted relief. I wanted the storm gone in my life. I wanted the storm to leave me. I didn't want the storm anymore. I wanted to be healed. I didn't want grace to be made perfect in my weakness. I wanted out of the weakness. And so I was praying for the, the storm to go, but God's saying, my grace is sufficient for you right now. And so through time, my faith went up and down and wavered here and there, but I started to pray that more and more. God was using other verses to say that he was preparing something for me. This storm had a purpose and to pray for that purpose. I couldn't even pray that for myself because I felt the pain, but I could believe it for the guy that was gonna come out on the other side of the storm. And so I started praying for that guy. I almost had to distance myself from the person and say, God, you're gonna prepare something great. I'm praying for that person who you're gonna do something with. God gave me his word to stand on in the midst of the storm. I didn't like the storm. I didn't want to be in the storm, but I grew to appreciate what God did in the midst of the storm because it helped me to stand in the midst of it. And God did more. God did more by letting me go through a storm than just getting me out of the storm anyways. God's word is able to be a foundation underneath our feet. Storms will come, but we can stand on something greater. Someone say Amen. Number two is this, we must be established in our faith. We must be established in our faith. Pastor Vinny talked last Sunday, we were talking about the early church in Acts 2. Remember, they had prayed, uh, Jesus gave them the commission, they went up in the upper room, they were praying, the Holy Spirit comes in power, Peter goes out and preaches a very basic but Holy Spirit-filled uh, message to everybody, and they asked, what should we do with what we just heard? And he says in Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's many things that could be unpacked here, but the one thing I want to pull out is that he's saying there's an exchange to our life. It's not just raise your hand one day and, and you get all the benefits of, of being a, a believer. And you're not, No, it's like you've got to exchange your life. I'm laying down my life. I'm repenting of my ways of living. I'm repenting of my sins. I'm turning away from, I'm changing my mind about them. And now I'm giving my life to follow you, Jesus Christ. You are the leader and the Lord of my life. As I make that exchange, then I get some benefits along the way. There's forgiveness for my sins, cleansing me of washing me of all, someone say all, all of my sins, all of my unrighteousness, no matter how checkered my past is, God has cleansed me and forgiven me of all of my past and he's given us the free gift of his Holy Spirit. There's an exchange for our lives. And friends, what's been a burden on my heart this week as I've been preparing is that we've gotta make a choice to either fully put our feet planted on the place where my faith is in Jesus Christ and him only, and we've gotta make a decision. I think many times we're in between decisions. For me, it was simple. When I was in my early 20s, you know, I'd grown up in the church, and so and in many ways, my faith was because of my parents. They had told me, you know, all of this. They'd raised me in the church, and so I had a faith because I grew up in the church, but I had to make a decision for myself. Am I gonna believe it because I believe in Jesus? And so I was, I was caught in this middle place, but for me, it was simple. I can't pick and choose the things I want. I can't say, well, I like the part about where Jesus loves me and forgives me. We all like that part, right? I like that part. I like the part about how he has a good plan and a purpose for my life to prosper me. Oh, I like that part. Does anybody like that part, right? 
We like that part. But when it came to lay down my life, that I was no longer my own, I was bought with a price, I don't like that part as much. You know, to, to love other people with Christ's love, I don't like that part as much. And we can't pick and choose what we want. We've got to make a decision. Either, either all of this we're just making up and so it's pointless, or Jesus really did die on the cross. He really did raise from the dead. And that same power that raised him from the dead now lives on the inside of me. One or the other. It's not in between. And I've got to make a choice. What do I believe? And so for me, it's very simple. There's so much evidence in my life, around my life, and historical evidence, which points to Jesus really did live, he really did die, and he really did get up from the grave. Well, then I'm going to put my full confidence in that God. I'm giving my whole life to that God. I'm putting my feet firmly planted that my faith is in Jesus Christ and him alone. It's not in all of the world. It's not what the world has to offer, because I've also tasted and seen what the world has to give and it fluctuates up and down, left and right, all over the place. But Jesus does not change. Nothing can separate me from his love, that he can carry me through any battle and any challenge. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 6, 16. He says, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. Someone say shield of faith, which you can extinguish. Someone say extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, that there's a conviction to our belief. I'm not praying passive prayers, but when all hell is coming against me, the devil's telling me I can't do it. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. My past is too checkered. You won't be able to do it. No one will accept you. No one will love you. Nobody wants you there. When the enemy's coming with all of his lies, telling me God's not gonna come through for you, you might as well pick up the pieces and do it yourself. Then I can hold up a shield of faith for my life. He can do talking, but he doesn't get to come and the flaming darts don't get to touch me. They don't get to touch my family. They don't get to touch my life. I was bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. That means the enemy has no more power, has no more authority to help influence my life anymore. So when the devil's doing talking, I can tell him you get to shut up because you don't get to talk to me anymore. I am a son of the most high king. And so you can take all your talking business somewhere else. The fiery dark don't have to touch us, friends, because we have a shield of faith. God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know you're going to do it. I know that there's no mountain too big for you. I know there's no two valley that's too low for you. I know that you make crooked roads straight. You're going to lead me all the way through this. You're going to take care of me. So God, I'm putting up this shield of faith. The enemy needs to take his talking away from us and we don't have to stay under it anymore. Anybody want that in their life? I'm, I'm, I think we give the enemy too much credit sometimes. We give him too much authority. He has no authority over our life anymore if I've received Jesus into my life. He has no power or authority over our life. He doesn't get to keep talking to us anymore. All that he can do is we let him talk is to get us out of position, to get us out of a place of where our faith is no longer fully in God. And when I do that, now I'm being tormented. Now life is difficult. Now I can't see clearly anymore. Now I don't have wisdom. I don't understand what's happening anymore. That's why our feet have to be planted in faith. God, you're gonna make a way where there seems to be no way. You're gonna open up a door. You were the same God that was with Moses when that sea parted. You're the same God that was with Daniel in the midst of that lion's den. You were the same God that was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. You were the same God that was with Paul and Silas in the midst of that prison cell where the chains were broken off. You are the same God that rose Jesus from the dead and that same power now lives inside of me today. That is the faith that we put our feet on. That's the confidence. Storms are coming. And I'm not praying against the storms. I'm praying for the faith to be able to withstand the storms, to hold up that shield of faith so that the the power of it doesn't have to touch me anymore. I still hear the rain. I still feel the thunder and the lightning, but it doesn't have to impact me or my family with the same way anymore because we have a shield to hold up. Someone say amen. You know, in our growth groups, we're filled with people that have had similar circumstances, that have had to go through similar storms, that have faced similar insecurities. Maybe they have not gone through the same exact things, but you're gonna have people that just say, I'm gonna stand with you through this. We're gonna pray together. Can I call you in two days? And we're gonna pray together through this. We're gonna believe that you're gonna get all the way through this storm. That's what our growth groups are built around. We wanna be founded in the word of God and to help us to hold up our shield of faith. The third thing is this. 
we must be established in biblical community. These are the three materials that make up our foundation that can be grounded on the things of God. If we are grounded in the word of God, we're grounded in our faith, and we're grounded and established in, our, in biblical community with one another. You know, when Jesus calls the disciples, he says, get out of the boat, come follow me. You know, they weren't, Peter's not like, hey, you know, Jesus, I got availability every other Monday, so maybe we can set up a schedule then. And, you know, like, I don't really, you know, these other guys, they're a little crazy, so I'm just going to kind of like, I'll, me and you, we'll have a one-on-one together. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a solo journey. He was calling them on. They did life together. It, it was a group activity, a team sport. Following God is for all of us to do together. If time permitted, you can go through all the verses to talk about how we're the body of Christ. We need one another. I can't do life by myself. If we look at when, when Peter was preaching that message uh, to all of those people in the early church, it says 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus, started following him. And then it says in Acts 2, verse 42, then it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching for simplicity. It's like the Sunday service, the big gathering that we have. It says they also devoted themselves uh, to the uh, teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And all three of those is like to the big services together, to the personal relationship with Jesus, but also to fellowship with one another. That I'm a part of the body of Christ now. I can't do it by myself. My faith can only go so far by myself. I need other people's faith to help me sometimes. Seeing God be a provider for somebody else has given me confidence that, God, you're gonna provide for me. You'll take care of me. You're no respecter of persons. You did it for them. You're gonna do it for me, right? Seeing other people with their breakthroughs and their testimonies has like, God, you're gonna get me all the way through this. I've seen you do it before. You'll do it again, right? To have other people that have loved me at my worst, to still love me unconditionally has helped minister the love of Jesus to me as well. To have people who have helped say, hey, I know you're going through it right now, but we're going to be around you. We're going to support you. We're going to love you. That's been incredibly valuable to me in my walk with God. But not just about receiving. To be able to be used by God to minister to somebody else, there's nothing more fulfilling on this earth. There's no, nothing that money can buy. There's no job that can help give you that kind of feeling that you have when you can be a blessing to somebody else, when you can stand with somebody, when they're going through it, and you can watch them get all the way through. There's nothing more fulfilling in your life than by being used by God. And that happens by doing life together with one another. You know, I wanna share this to kind of close out the service. I shared about uh, with my back, I was back in 2021, a couple years before that, you know, my wife and I, we'd been a part of growth groups many years, our whole life. And, but we had taken a couple years where we hadn't really been involved in growth groups as much. You know, my job had changed, so I was kind of going around, hopping around to growth groups. At the same time, we now had a two-year-old. We had a newborn. She's working. She's got, um, you know, she's also going to school at the same time. We were busy, right? You had a two-year-old and a newborn. Life was busy. There was no group out in St. Cloud, which is where we live. There's nothing. So it was like we're, we couldn't drive somewhere. So we just like, we can't do growth groups right now. About two years that went on. And then it was that summer where we started praying and we had our secret growth group. They get on me because I call it a secret growth group. But it was myself and my wife. We were going through the storm, which was centered around my back and going through all this pain. At the same time, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, they had their own storms they were going through. And so we just like, we're taking the summer. We all know we need to seek God together. So no agenda is like, we're just seeking God. We're just going through this together. And there were times where we came in and I, had, I got to share openly and honestly, where I can't say it on a Sunday, but I can say then, I don't know why God's not healing me, right? I can be honest about it. I'm struggling right now. I've prayed for other people and I've seen healing, but why am I not being healed? And I'm really discouraged about that. And I had the openness and the, the vulnerability to share that. And nobody said, well, you know you should trust God. You know that. It's like, no, we're gonna stand with you through this. I understand. My heart posture was, I wanna trust God. I'm struggling right now. There was a, the next week, I might come in and be like, listen, my back's not changed, but my, my trust is in God. I'm doing great. I'm trusting God. He's using this to do some things deep inside of me. I'm so thankful for what he's doing. And there were times their faith was high, their faith was low, and we got to feed off each other. It was a mess. It was ups and downs. It was left and right. I mean, it was a mess. But at the same time, we came to the end of that summer and knew all four of us took a giant step forward with the Lord. All four of us saw, I've gone farther in this summer going through the trials of life than I could have by myself. And so it was there, no matter how busy our life was, we made a commitment, we've gotta make time for this. We've got to do life with other people. 
I didn't have a growth group. I was going to myself. We still didn't have any group in St. Cloud. So we're like, let's start one. Let's do a group in St. Cloud. We're like Monday nights, 8 p.m. St. Cloud. You know, we wanted our kids to be able to get to bed. It was chaotic. You heard like dog howling noises in the room right next to us because of the kid, right? It's just, it was chaotic. It was fun. But we also knew, we're like, who's coming to a group on Monday nights at 8 p.m. in St. Cloud? And sure enough, people started coming. People wanted to come to it. People were at it. And we started to see that life was happening. People got saved in the group. People had where the enemy was oppressing them. They got free from the oppression. People were walking with God, new in their faith. It was an exciting time as we started the group. We didn't know what it was going to look like, but we got to see God do more in that in community. I'll tell you this, friends. We're all busy. All of us are busy. But we make time for what we value. And I recognized at that summer in 2021, something changed in me. It was like, I value walking through life with other people. I can't just be around community. I need to be in community with other people. I was made to do life with one another. And so no matter how busy our schedule is, no matter how much we have going on, for me and my family, we've chosen, we're sacrificing for this. We'll do what it takes to be around other people because I need it. My faith isn't always strong by myself, but being around other people, there's a steadiness to my walk with God that I can't get by myself. Amen? Amen. And so if you're a part of a group, make sure you go to a growth group. If you don't have a group or you don't know a group to be a part of, we want to help get you connected. You're going to see a lot of people in these green Better Together shirts. They might come talk to you and just share with you about their group. Give it a shot. Worst comes to worst. It doesn't work out and you can help find another group, but give it a shot because we believe that we really are better when we do life together. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for every opportunity to do life with one another. Lord, help us to be strengthened in the word of God and being the foundation. Help us to be strengthened in our faith, to hold up that shield of faith when all hell is coming against us and that we would be connected together with other believers. Lord, we want to go after you together. Help give us the strength and the confidence. Get us plugged into the right group, the right place, the right people that we have in our life. God, bless this growth group semester. This will be a time of sincere growth, exponential growth in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you in growth groups this week.